Most universities uh, in the, the past little while have been holding town hall meetings with the faculty and staff and students uh, to inform them about the financial situation of the university. And we have held off a little bit at Carleton University on doing that because we wanted to get a little more certainty. Um, I don't believe that's a good idea to tell everybody that you know this might happen and that might happen and another thing might happen and if it did we might do much better to tell everybody this is what we're fairly sure is going to happen and this is what we can do. And so we've waited a little bit. We are extremely fortunate at Carlton that our situation is not like some of the other institutions and it isn't like some of the other institutions because of the strong leadership in the past and also because we have been really wise with our uh, investments and with what we've done with our uh, money. And we can thank uh, Duncan and his team for their excellent leadership and their excellent stewardship of our resources. Some of you might say, well, why is it that some schools are having to cut huge amounts of money? And I just explained it this morning on the telephone to one of the staff members from the uh, Ministry of Colleges and Universities. Uh, when I was at the University of Toronto, uh, while well, I was at Victoria, but associated with the University of Toronto, we had a, a goal to raise 300 chairs, endow them. So we endowed 300 chairs, and the salary was to be paid from the endowment. When the endowment investment went down, there was no money to pay those salaries, and so the operating budget had to get cut. Now, Carleton University doesn't have 300 chairs, which is really too bad. It would be nice if we did. But today, it's nice that we don't because we don't have to cut that fund from our budget. It's money that we never had. Um, so because of that, um, I've actually just tried to get the Council of Ontario Universities talking about a sustainability fund for universities so that we ask the province in the next five years as they do their looking forward to give us sustainability money so that we can invest in new things and each university can use the money as needed. If you're at the University of Toronto, you have to make up those endowments. If you're at Carleton, we have to make up some pension funds, but we also can invest in the future. So we do need the province to look at the universities and give us sustainability support in the future. But before we look at what's going to happen to the whole province, it's really good to look at what's happening at Carleton, and I can't think of a better person than Duncan Watt to give us that exact figure and portrait of where we are and where we think we're going. Um, Duncan. So this would be a good time for you people at the back to come down to the front. You make me nervous standing back there. No, come have a seat, yes. So my presentation will be about 30 minutes long, uh, and at the end there'll be lots of time uh, for questions. Uh, the presentation will be taped, so it'll be available on our website if uh, you hear anybody who's actually really interested and missed it today. Uh, so as Rosanna said, it's no secret that these are challenging financial times. Uh, uh, for Carleton, we're kind of in a status quo mode for a 2009-10 budget year, uh, whereas she's just indicated many, probably most Ontario universities are currently going through three, five, six, seven percent budget cuts this year, looking at 15 to 20 percent budget cuts over the next three years. Um, we're not in that position, but our financial future in the medium term is fairly uncertain for, I would say, two reasons, and I'll talk about it in the presentation. Uh, we're about to start making extraordinary payments to our pension plan next year. That's one, and I'll talk about it in more detail. And there's a lot of uncertainty around our future, being able to grow our revenue stream in the future. Um, we're very dependent on the Government of Ontario for increased uh, growth in our uh, income and the operating budget. And as we look forward, it's um, we're, we're not quite sure. But I'll talk about both of those things in more detail in the presentation. Uh, here's an outline of the presentation that I'm going to go through today. Uh, this is a financial overview of uh, Carleton University. Uh, most of the time we're going to talk today about our operating budget. Uh, just to position us in Ontario, we're 
kind of in the middle of the pack. There are 17 universities in Ontario, and, and most of these metrics we measure number 8, 9, or 10. So we have the, actually the 10th, we're number 10 in terms of the size of our operating budget. Um, we actually have, it's fairly small for the number of students, but we don't have a medical school or law school, and all those things generate higher fees for universities that have those. Uh, our ancillary budgets represents the nine ancillary units uh, that are self-funding, uh, bookstore, residence, food service, graphics. Uh, we're very fortunate that all of those uh, units are in good financial shape today, so that's good news for us. It actually helps a lot with our, the cash flow of the university, so that's a positive thing. Research, this is our annual research expenditures. We've stabilized at that number for the last about three years. Uh, so we're number eight in terms of research dollars in the province of Ontario. Capital, that's the new construction activity going on. Uh, so it varies quite a bit from year to year. Um, that's what we think we'll be spending this year though. Our pension and the endowment, those are sums of money that we have invested. Um, both those numbers are about 20% smaller than they were a year ago uh, due to the downturn in the financial markets that happened last fall. So for the pension fund, and it's really a major problem for us because we have the, uh, the actuarial assumption in our pension plan that it's going to grow by 6% a year. It's actually shrunk by just over 20%, so that's like a 25, 26% gap between actual performance and the assumption in the plan. And so that's, we'll talk about it in more detail, but that creates a major financial challenge for us. The endowment fund is actually less of a challenge. Um, most of the money in the endowment fund at Carleton is for student aid. Uh, we have a four-year moving average uh, that we uh, determine the uh, pay annual payout calculation. So it turns out our endowment fund four years ago was actually a little smaller in this. So there's actually a very small decrease in the amount of money available for student aid out of the endowment fund. So compared to, for example, the example that Roseanne gave of uh, where universities have endowed chairs funded, or a lot of endowed chairs, that's not an issue for us. The right button here. Uh, this is where we get our money from. Uh, so we, in round numbers, we get 58%, or it's actually 48% of our money from a government grant. Uh, the government of Ontario pays a grant for each different type of student. So we have a fund for undergraduates, masters, and PhD, a separate fund for each. We have a target number of students in each of those categories. Uh, different types of students generate a different level of government grant. Our major challenge over the last two years is there's been virtually no growth in base funding. Uh, there's a little bit of fiscal money we've got, but uh, the government grant has actually grown very little over the last two years. And this is a major question going forward, is it going to grow in the future? Tuition fees, well those are the fees paid by the students, uh, which is 47%, and then we have the miscellaneous fees, which are also paid by students for miscellaneous services. So. When you add together tuition fees and miscellaneous fees, it adds up to actually 50% of our grant. So what you should remember from this is two things. One, we're very dependent on the number of students here for our financial health. And secondly, this has greatly controlled the revenue stream by the government of Ontario. Because they determine what the government grant is and they determine the maximum we can charge for tuition fees. So we control the number of students to a certain degree here, but the amount of money we get per student is controlled by the province. Where do we spend our money? Well, not surprisingly, I guess we spend it on people. So if you look at the uh, salaries and the staff benefit pies, uh, there's 75% of our budget is uh, spent on people costs. And when you look at the other smaller pies and the other 25%, uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility in there. Uh, the big pie is for building maintenance. The biggest pie in the other section is student aid at $22 million. You know, it's money we're paying to attract students. So we do not have a lot of flexibility in those, the 25% of pies that are, do not go to staff costs. However, we have complete control over this, right? It's so the university has control over how we actually spend our money limited control on how we get our money.
This is a sort of a historical look at what's happened to Carleton over the last uh, 15 years. Uh, if you go back to the mid 90s, well, let's look at these bars first. So the, uh, the blue bars are income, the red bars are annual expenses. So in 95, 96, we spent more money than we brought in. Uh, the yellow bars are annual result and the big blue bars are accumulated result. So for in the mid-90s, for three years in a row, we actually spent more money than we uh, brought in, uh, which resulted in 97-98, uh, us having an accumulated operating deficit of about $30 million a year. And a couple overheads, of, you will see that this was uh, almost exclusively called by a precipitous drop in our undergraduate, uh, the size of our undergraduate student body. So this was a very difficult time for Carleton University, for those of you that were here. Uh, we had a voluntary reduction plan where we paid people to leave the university, and so about 20% of our faculty and staff, 15 to 20%, actually left the university in this time frame. So it was a very difficult time for everyone that was here. Uh, so that was the uh, mid-90s. And then we go into the uh, early 2000s. It was the mid-late 90s. Then we go into the uh, early 2000s. It was the double cohort period in the province of Ontario. Uh, so in one year, they had two graduating high school classes. Um, the number of high school students, some students fast track, some slow track, but we went through a period where the undergraduate enrollment at Carleton and all Ontario universities went up significantly was also at a time where the provincial government felt, uh, I think, obligated, because they were the ones who decided to eliminate grade 13, that they needed to fund universities in order to actually to take these additional students. So we had a period of sort of exceptional uh, growth in our income, which was that you see the growth in that blue bar. The reason that we're not in financial difficulty last year or this year, where many of our sister institutions are, because we didn't spend all of that growth income from the early 2000s on base expenditures. You can see from the graph that the red bar is almost as big as the blue bar, so we spent the money, uh, but a lot of the money we spent on fiscal one-time expenditures. So the capital improvements you've seen on campus, that's how we spent the money. And so that base ongoing funding, we kept a reserve uh, because as we looked at our charts of our sort of our future enrollment growth, as we looked out five, six years, we thought our undergraduate enrollment was going to level off, uh, which as you'll see in a moment, exactly what it's done. Uh, then we come up to more recent years. Uh, there's been a leveling off of the number of undergraduate students, which has caused our sort of net income to uh, net income, our gross income, total income to uh, level off. That's because we've continued to grow our first year class after the double cohort by about 3% a year. But we have the flow through effect of those big enrollments from 2002, 2003, 2004. And as they've worked their way through the system, the total number of undergraduates has leveled off, and thus our income has leveled off. So as we uh, think about our budget, uh, on the revenue side, we've already talked about this, uh, but we have to look at what are the number of students that we're going to have at the university, and what's the tuition fee and the grant we're going to get per student. And as we sort of crystal ball our way into the future, we're trying to guess what's the Government of Ontario going to do. So 2009-10 is the last year of the McGuinty government's four-year reaching higher plan, um, where they articulated a tuition fee framework and a, a grant framework for a four-year period. Now we have a commitment from the government that they're going to announce a reaching higher two. It'll probably have a different name uh, sometime before the next budget year, which will be a four-year funding framework for four years going forward. So we've made the guess, estimate in our three-year financial planning model that uh, the tuition fee framework will remain the same, uh, that universities will be allowed to put up tuition fees on average 5% a year. And we've also assumed, though, that there'll be no increase in the government grant in the next three years. Uh, so we'll find out, I don't know, hopefully soon, but more realistically, uh, probably next February, maybe even March, with the provincial budget speech, what that framework is going to be going forward. Uh, we all have our, uh, well, anybody can have a guess. It could be as good as ours um, about the ability of the Ontario government to pay going forward. Uh, 
So we've obviously made a, a conservative estimate, or at least a conservative estimate by Canadian standards. If you look south of the border, you'll see many state universities are actually having their government grants slashed, but that has not been the typical activity in Canada. Freezing them is normally the worst they do. Yeah. Um, on the expenditure side, uh, the two issues are pension plan and salary growth. So first, the pension plan. So we have a seem, we all seem to think, well, I, don't know, I think, well, hopefully you think, we have a fairly good pension plan at Carleton. Um, we're going to move into a period of making significant extraordinary payments because of the performance of the financial markets and low long-term interest rates. Uh, the pension committee is looking at the pension plan today in terms of sort of predictability. So our plan's not so good in terms of predictability. So what do we as employees want in the pension plan? I think we want a, what, what a predictable uh, pension when we come to retirement age. Well, the way our plan is designed, that's actually not happening today. People's pensions are being significantly reduced now. If you would have went and got a pension estimate two years ago compared to what your estimate you're going to be getting today because of the return in the markets. And I think people would like to, once they do retire, have some form of predictable increase, CPI, some sort of increase in their plan. Whereas people that retired in Carleton in 2001 2 have not had an increase in their pension since they retired. And from the university or the employer's perspective, we'd like to have predictable payments into the pension plan. Whereas we're soon going to be, 2010-11, it's a year out, uh, probably making payments in the order of, you know, we'll look at some real numbers, but probably about 5 to 6% of payroll are going to be our extraordinary payments to the pension plan. Second challenge we have is salary growth. Uh, salaries for the last few years in Carleton have increased by about 5% a year. Uh, for faculty, a little more than that. For staff, a little less than that in percentage terms. Uh, that reads, that's an annual cost of about $9 million a year. So for us to stand still as an organization with the same number of faculty and staff employees, we need to actually grow our income by about $9 million a year. Uh, that has been sustainable for us in recent years because we had that significant growth in our income from the early 2000s. Uh, but it doesn't look like it's sustainable for us going forward unless the government of Ontario comes up with some new granting structure that's, uh, well, I don't know if it injects some new money into the system, right? So that'll be the key to that. Undergraduate students, uh, that, well, this is this, uh, <clears throat> I've probably said it a couple times, I'll keep talking about it. This is the economic engine of the university. Um, for, as you can see here, this was the double cohort period in uh, 2003, four. Uh, that sort of spike in uh, first year enrollment sort of caused the uh, spike in the total enrollment of uh, the total number of undergraduates. As those students has worked their way through the system, the number of undergraduates actually dipped slightly at the university two years ago. Uh, we've maintained the, uh, as I said earlier, about two and a half to three percent growth in the number of first year students. Uh, we appear to be on track to do that again for this fall, so that's very good news. Uh, but our financial health is actually, it's critically important that uh, we meet these targets, which will then result in the uh, number, total number of undergraduates at the university increasing fairly significantly uh, going forward. Graduate students, uh, this was a new, in a new initiative from the provincial government uh, about three years ago, I think, maybe four years ago with Reaching Higher, where they articulated uh, funding targets, so they will fund X number of master students, Y number of uh, PhD students. Uh, you can see from the graph that we're basically on target for the number of PhD students at Carleton. Uh, we expect that we'll get up to the funded level for the number of PhD students at Carleton this fall, or we'll be very close to it. There has been a significant increase in our revenue associated with uh, this growth in uh, graduate student population, but we've actually spent a little more money on attracting those students and student support than we've received in income from tuition and grant. Um, that's because there's been a very competitive situation in Ontario since the government announced these sort of increased enrollment numbers for graduate students for all Ontario universities. So there's a really, 
not a financial benefit from having this, but of course there's a significant benefit to the reputation and to the research enterprise of the university by continuing to grow it. But it's very difficult for us to be able to afford to have either masters or PhD students for which we're not getting a government grant for. Uh, shifting along to what happened in the provincial budget this year, uh, there was not a lot, well, that's not true. There was some very good news for all Ontario universities, including us. Uh, the first was the uh, Infrastructure Works Program, the Knowledge Infrastructure Works Program, uh, where the Government of Ontario matched the federal government's uh, funding for new construction. Uh, so out of this particular pot, we received $26.5 million that was matched by the federal government. So it has allowed us to proceed with the construction of the river and canal building with putting no university operating funds into the capital cost. So that's very good news because two years ago we were planning to totally self-finance these two buildings. Um, and then around Christmas time with the decline in the markets, we decided we probably couldn't go forward with both buildings. Now, because of this program, we are able to do that, so that's very good news for us. Uh, we did get $2.8 million in one-time fiscal money. Um, one million of that we've actually spent on additional one-time graduate student support money. Uh, and there was this gra additional money for graduate fellowships. It's a bit of a bizarre thing why they did this, but... Uh, uh, we got $500,000 which we endowed and so at our spending rate out of the endowment fund it'll provide about $20,000 a year. So it's, it's a good thing but it's very modest. Uh, GST, PST harmonization, that's for July 2010. Uh, they said that it's going to be revenue neutral. Uh, I don't think they or us know what that actually means yet but I think it is clear there will probably be winners and losers within the universities. <laughs> Maybe revenue neutral overall, but there are probably some activities that are going to be uh, negatively impacted by this. And the pension plan, um, extending solvency payments. So this is a very good thing. Um, I'll talk about it in the uh, next overhead. Um, so I, I pretty much talked about this, but um, you know, one of our challenges going forward is are we going to be able to grow our revenue? Um, Salary costs are pretty much inflationary, um, you know, and as we crystal ball this, you know, we think it's going to be very hard for us to sort of grow our income by the 9 to $10 million that we've needed in past years. So and much of the uncertainty associated with this is we're probably not going to hear until February, March of next year, and our budget year starts on May 1st. So. We will probably need to, for the first time ever, delay our budget considerations for next year until we get the, uh, maybe the provincial uh, budget or at least an indication from the province about uh, what's happening. And then on the uh, pension, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Uh, so first the top bullet, uh, going concern. So every three years in Ontario, Pension plan uh, sponsors, which uh, Carleton is one, are required to file evaluations with the provincial government. There are two tests. The first test is a going concern. Do you have enough money in your plan to meet the on an assumption your plan continues forever, and do you have enough money in your plan to meet that ongoing obligation? Anything? Uh, the second test assumes the solvency test uh, that you're going to wind up your pension plan. Uh, like could happen because the institution closed or the institution decided that they wanted to have a different form of a pension plan. So it takes all the money that's currently in your pension plan and it uh, assumes that you invested in some sort of guaranteed investment certificate and you pay that money out, you use that money to pay the pension obligation or the pension promise to people that have already retired or the people that are still working within the organization. Uh, this is greatly infected by, affected by long-term interest rates. So long-term interest rates are at a long time low. So, you know, the lower the interest rates are, the bigger your pot of money needs to be. Prior to the uh, pension, or prior to the provincial budget this year, that amortization period was five years that you had to pay that money back. They've extended it to 10. 
and then the increase to the minimum guarantee at sort of the defined benefit that underlines our, uh, the defined benefit aspect of our plan that underlies our pension plan. Because of the downturn in the market, we will be looking at increased premium payments to that. So what are our payments going to be when we do our next valuation in July 2010? It depends on long-term interest rates and it depends on the performance of financial markets between now and then. So I don't know, we've averaged it here. We've said seven to 13 million. Would I say $10 million is the number we're planning on? Uh, prior to the provincial budget, if I would have made this presentation in March, I said the number was going to be $15 million. And so the impact of extending the solvency repayment period from five to 10 years is about $5 million a year. So that's a big benefit for the university. So next steps. Uh, well, we're going to talk a lot about uh, just to ensure that our community is aware of our, uh, the financial situation so that there's uh, no surprises. Um, we're in the midst of organizing a meeting with our uh, union leadership that will happen in the late summer just so to ensure they're aware. Uh, we will have another town hall meeting in the fall. We'll be putting a website up that will, where people can go and uh, find the financial information, things like this presentation today. And if any of you have ideas on how we could communicate better, we would be uh, delighted to hear that. We did institute a new planning framework over the last year, so I don't know. I, I, well, I don't know. <clears throat> to better ensure that our budget managers could see a linkage between the budget process and the strategic plan of the university. Uh, we will be launching a, a task force. Uh, we haven't actually settled on what the name of it's going to be in the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, it'll have a mandate to look at three things. Uh, one, is there any ways we could increase our revenue? Are there two, is there any things we're doing that today that are wasteful? And then maybe a combination of things. Are there any innovative things we could be doing that would help us achieve either of the above two? Uh, we will provide some seed money of about a half a million dollars to this group. Uh, and so the role of this uh, task force will be one to canvas the campus community for ideas, uh, try and apply some sort of filter for what are good and bad ideas, and then to try to successfully implement the good ideas. Uh, we also, for the first time this year, are... Uh, directly linking the teaching faculty's budget with their enrollment. Um, about half of the Ontario, that's not true, half of Canadian, Canadian universities are already doing this. Uh, we've not done it in the past, um, but we've introduced to the deans a uh, sort of a formula base that if a uh, faculty increases its enrollment uh, next fall, it'll automatically get some additional operating dollars from the center, right? Um, so this is, I don't know, <clears throat> to try and ensure that everyone actually <laughs> has a, a vested interest in actually the attracting and retaining uh, additional students to the university. And last, uh, the Administrative and Academic Restructuring Committee um, was launched a couple weeks ago. This has actually nothing to do with uh, cost savings or financial issues, but it's the last time we, well, the purpose of the committee is to try and ensure that there are organizational structure matches our strategic plans and the, need, the needs of our students. Uh, the last time we did this was in 96, 97, so it seems like an opportune time for us to look at it again. So that'll be chaired by uh, Faraday and, and the incoming provost, uh, Peter Ricketts. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of my presentation. I think Roseanne has a few comments before we move on to the question period. Yeah. That's about the warmest applause I've heard for not such great news in a long time. Thank you very much, Duncan. Um, this, these are times when we have to be creative, we have to be cohesive, and we have to be strong. Um, we have to be cohesive, we have to work together. And by working together, we can move this university ahead no matter if there are hard times. In fact, my grandfather, when I was a we child said to me, you know, in the middle of depressions, in the middle of the hardest times, smart people who work together 
get ahead. There are always winners. And Carlton can be that winner. And I know that we can do this. We've got all the elements for success. We've got right now a little bit of time. And that time can make it so that we can plan that success and figure out how we can get there and do the smart things to achieve success. Um, creativity. We can just think a little bit outside the box and figure out a way that we can persuade the government to help us continue and give us the funds we need. Um, we can also look at what are the situations in the, in the province of Ontario. Right now, there's a great lot of students in the GTA area. There's talk, should we just have a new university in the GTA area? Should we build a new school down there? Um, I've, I've been in Toronto and I said, you don't need to build a new school in Toronto when there's spaces in, Ontario, in, in Ottawa um, and in other schools. Rather than pay for a new institution, why don't you pay a, a little bit for their, the students so they can afford residency here and, and, and make, uh, make the investment be in the students and then help the whole system? I think if we all carry the message together, we can achieve there. I think also when we look at what we're doing inside the university, when we talk about restructuring, are we all doing the right things at the right time? Carleton has succeeded because it was innovative. We had the exciting programs, the cutting edge things. Where do we have to position ourselves to be really cutting edge for the future? What can we do that will today ensure our success for the future? Um, we've got a lot of ideas. I know you have a lot of ideas. This is an exciting time for us to unleash those ideas and make them work. It's also not a time for the faint of heart. You know, when um, times are a little tough, it's really easy to say, no, I'm not going to consider that. That's not, that's not part of it. I'm only going here. And you do have to be focused. But if you say no all the time, um, sometimes you miss things that will help the institution. So I'm going to give you a crazy example. Um, some people came to the university and said, you know, what would you do if we gave you enough money to have football? Well, my first thought was, I don't know, I don't need football right now. We've got enough problems as it is. Let's just solve our current problems. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, if I say no to a part of the community that wants to help do something, then I turn them off. Maybe I should say, well, you know, if you actually give us enough money, maybe we could do it. Maybe it would be possible. Let's not close the door. Let's be creative and open. Maybe there are other things that we haven't thought about that would be really exciting to do at the, at the university that we'd rather do. Well, let's look at them too. Let's keep our minds open to all of the possibilities that exist out there and not say, because it's hard times, we're not going to do them. Let's say, because it's hard times, we're going to do them smart, well, cohesively, and also knowing that when you've got the winning team, everybody wants to play on that team. So we just have to make sure that our team starts getting lots of wins. And I think we did already this year demonstrate that we could do it. Big win with the students. <clears throat> not talking about the basketball game, although that was really great. Um, but big win with a Rhodes Scholarship. Big win with faculty members getting incredible distinctions and awards. Um, big win, we got more students coming in for the fall. And the quality of those students, their grade point average has increased. Excellent for Carleton University. Big win, we got two new buildings. We can keep on winning and make things really work in an exciting and, and fun way at, at this university. One of the things will be the, the master plan as we look to how, how we should develop the campus in the future. There are so many possibilities. So while we think of all of those possibilities, um, we also, I'm sure, have concerns. So please ask any questions you'd like to ask, and um, Duncan will answer them, right? <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and, and give us any good ideas that you have. And if you don't have them right now, if this has just been enough for you to digest, um, remember that there's email. You can email us. Um, remember there's the telephone. And then there's that old-fashioned paper, paper and pencil. Um, 
we love notes and suggestions. Um, please feel free at any time. And there's no idea that's too small, and there's no ex uh, suggestion that's too silly. Um, Duncan just told me that somebody said to him, you know, um, I had two little ideas. Well, those two little ideas were really worth a lot of money when you come down to it. So there's no idea that's little and no idea that's too small to be considered. We take questions and ideas. I'm very glad you uh, gave us those words on uh, working together. Um, and as someone who represents uh, a body within this university, I'd like to know um, what plans you have for student representation on the task forces that will be deciding where money is spent and where money is saved. And specifically, representation from students who are in some semblance accountable to bodies within this university. OK, yes, students will be represented. But I don't understand the second half of your question, although I think I might. <laughs> um, students who are not handpicked by the university administration to sit on these bodies. Students that are mm -hmm. somewhat accountable. Okay, does the, do you mean that you want um, the president of your student body, or do you want to have a general election for the, the position of represented on the committee? Um, I would think that any interested student um, that re already represents bodies would be there already and volunteering to, uh, to be sitting on those committees. But if the university wanted to canvas mm -hmm. a wider body, I'm sure we'd all agree that that's probably a good idea. I'm just specifically okay. wondering, okay. will there be students sitting yes, on these there committees? Is, there is no barrier classes? to having students on the, on the committees. And yes, we, we plan to have students on the committees. And we will figure out a good way to do it. Sorry, so my name is Eric Hallowell. I'm the president of CUSA. Um, one of the questions I had is uh, obviously challenging economic times. Um, in the next budget, do you guys predict any program cuts whatsoever? Uh, yeah. I think it's very unlikely. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kim Lee. I'm the president of the Grad Students Association. Um, Mr. Watt, in your presentation, you mentioned that there's no financial benefit of recruiting students who don't have Canadian government grants, so I want to know what does this mean for the funding levels for international students? So the university provides um, about $23 million to the Faculty of Graduate Studies for student support each year. Uh, if John Shepard was here, I don't know, it doesn't look like he is. Um, so Graduate Studies <clears throat> decides how they're going to spend that money between international and domestic students. I don't, not really quite sure how they do that. Uh, I know there are some pots of money that are specifically directed to international students, but you know, generally we don't, uh, there's no plan to decrease sort of the total amount of money we're going to allocate to graduate studies in the next budget cycle. And as you probably know, I'm sure you do know, uh, grad international students generally across the university, generally international students pay more money than domestic students in tuition fees. But the amount of money the university gets in total income, this is generally speaking because it's different for different categories of students, but the income from an international student is about the same as the income from a domestic student, but the domestic student has two components, tuition fees and a government grant, but we don't get a government grant for the international students. So the other day I actually met with, uh, with the uh, Graduate Student uh, Council and they asked if we couldn't have a committee to look at graduate students and how they're welcome to the university and how they're treated at the university and the services available to them. And, and, and we will do that, but I didn't have a chance to do it yet. It was only a couple of days ago, right? Hi, um, my name is Mayor Chandra. I'm the Vice President of Finance of Carleton University Student Association. Um, I was just wondering, there's been concerns by uh, many students with disabilities um, about having an able swim program in athletics. Um, there has been a couple of meetings that have been held and apparently uh, the university hasn't been willing to put money aside for um, a crane for these students, um, which is unfortunate because these students with disabilities do pay an athletics fee. So I was curious to know as to what you guys do with the fee that they're paying for athletics if we're not making the uh, athletics facilities uh, available to them. I don't know uh, about this issue. It hasn't been raised with me. I don't know. Duncan, do you know? 
um, we'll look into it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, Wiz Long, and I'm uh, president of the support staff union. I'm glad to uh, see that you are concerned with communication and you want to, um, you invite ideas on communication because I am sure that our union has some ideas on that. Um, this is for Duncan. In March, you were quoted as saying that we will have no choice but to examine efficiencies and possible reductions for some of the services we provide in support of academic and non-academic operations. I understand about the task force. I would certainly hope that support staff would be represented on that task force as well because any reduction in services will automatically filter down to the work that we do and we should be, in fact, involved in an exercise of that kind. We're, uh, it's actually the role of the task force is, uh, in the first instance, or in any instance, it's actually not looking at reduction of services. The role of the task force is what I said, is looking to new ways to generate revenue, eliminate waste, uh, innovation in the workplace. Uh, but, uh, uh, anyway. Then what means are you considering for reducing expenditures? Uh, at the task force, we're not doing anything. Uh, That's if, what I mean for the task force. Yeah, no, we're actually at this point, we're really not doing anything. We've established the budget for 2009 and 10, uh, which is essentially a status quo budget. There was about a 1% increase in budget allocations in this budget process. Uh, we will launch a new budget process after we hear from the provincial government what the financial framework for the next four years is. Uh, you know, we're, I think we're all very hopeful that we do not have to go back to the period that we were at in the mid 90s of looking at reductions. Uh, so as the president has indicated, you know, we're lobbying the provincial government uh, to the best of our capability to have an increase in the grant, but uh, We'll just have to see what happens in that uh, process, right? But there is no intent to actually look at staff reductions now. And uh, I very much hope in the next budget uh, process for 2010-11, it won't be necessary either. But that's a question mark, right? Well, just... Yeah, there are, you know, when you have a, a possible reduction in funds, there are many ways to look at it. One way is to, to cut to mat match that. Another way is to... Um, increase your revenue and we can increase revenue through our student numbers or the student mix and and and, and see that we do that in an intelligent way uh, we can uh, increase our government grants and we can lobby the government to do that um, we can increase our donations from private um, individuals from foundations and we can increase our, our research grants and and uh, grants from from companies with whom we we do work um, so I think we have to look at all of the ways of increase as, uh, as our first line of, of, of activity. And sometimes uh, we can look at saying, that, you know, we've been um, working on one thing for a long time. Maybe we should shift our attention and work on something else that would be, you know, where we could get a little more uh, uh, revenue. And so we will look at those things, but that doesn't necessarily mean in a, um, a, a reduction. It just might mean that we, um, you know, fill out different applications. Okay. Yes, uh, Rosemary Wolskett, Chair of the Department of Law. Um, I've got a couple of questions. The first one is a clarification about this 50 million uh, that the province has given the university devoted to grad fellowships. I, is that post-grad fellowships? Is that what you meant? No, I, I think it's graduate fellowships. It's, it's, it's actually broadly... Uh, what was the number you were quoting? Well, I thought you said 50, 50 million. And maybe I've got that wrong. Uh, to grad fellowships. Oh, yeah, Carlton... No, that was that's too large. Carlton share was $513,000. Oh, okay. So that was for the total... I, I was totally confused. Okay. Which, which then results in us having about $20,000 annually to spend. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so is that to go to post-graduate fellowships, or is that to, for grad fellowships? 
Uh, I think it probably hasn't been decided. We've just received the money and we've uh, put it in our endowment account. And so next year will be the first time there'll be any money available to allocate from it. Mm -hmm. uh, the rules are very broadly defined as being for graduate student support. Uh, and it's $22,000 on top of something like $27 million if you take the money from the operating budget, the endowment fund, and research assistance that's coming from professor's grants. So it's just a drop in the bucket. But I'm not sure if Graduate Studies has specifically decided how they're going to spend that $20,000. Probably not, I would be guess. But. So, so my follow-up question to that is um, there are several PhD programs which are in process. Ours, the Department of Law's PhD program just got passed, approved at Graduate Faculty Board. So we're concerned, obviously, about funding for those PhD students. And we uh, wanted to know, I would like to know, is that possibility of using any of that money <clears throat> towards uh, future PhD programs? Well, it would certainly be a possibility. <laughs> we'll look to uh, the Dean of Graduate Studies to give us advice, but this would probably provide funding for two PhD students, right? So it's a pretty modest uh, contribution. Yeah. Two, two is plus. Uh, on, yeah. the, on the other hand, um, I did write a very strong letter to the Minister of uh, Trade Colleges and University Training Colleges and Universities, uh, um, saying that uh, we needed additional funds for graduate studies. And uh, yesterday, I got. Um, the answer back from him saying that he understands that, he understands our need. Um, he doesn't have any more money right now, but I think that we have to really push um, for the next round so that we do get increased funding uh, for that. And I have called the other universities in the COU and have um, uh, an agreement with the other presidents that we will make that graduate funding a very, very strong um, lobby item on our list for the um, setting our sights to or whatever they decide to call it, setting our sights higher. <laughs> well, that's okay. good to hear because we would like our program to go um, out of the university. We would, we would too. Yeah, well, but we, you know, given all yeah. the work, we would like to see it go forward this, this um, fall. Okay, uh, thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liz Martin. I'm a master's student. Uh, the university makes somewhere around 1.6 million in payment deferral charges and late tuition payment charges. So for me, um, that was a cost of $148 when I was a couple days late on paying my tuition this summer. So I'm wondering a couple of things. Uh, the first is, is there a cost to the university when students pay their tuition late? And if there isn't, how is, this, uh, how is this fee, the number of it, established? Where does that 148 come from? And then where does this $1.6 million go back to? Okay, you, you asked the other day the question of the uh, announcing of the fees, and we did, um, we did uh, talk with the business office about making the announcement more clear. Uh, now we'll find out if Duncan knows offhand, and if not, he'll look it up. Well, I'm not sure I have a really coherent answer to this. Um, well, first I know where the money goes. Uh, one of our first pie charts, we showed miscellaneous fees of $10 million, so it's part of those miscellaneous fees that are incorporated into the budget. Uh, why do we want to encourage students to pay their fees on time? Well, I think we want to encourage them to pay their fees on time, and it's a capacity issue uh, so that students, um, <clears throat> when we go to enroll students in programs, we need to know how many students are going to be in those programs so that other students, if they're not going to show up, other students can take those spots, right? So the late payment structure is all around encouraging students to pay in a timely way uh, so that we can manage the capacity of the university, right? And so if there was no penalty, if you didn't have to pay, if you could pay in December, you know, we wouldn't actually be able to manage the enterprise. So that's the reason for the late fee payment structure. Uh, you're part of your question about what does it exactly cost. I'm not sure that I could attach a dollar number to it. Or, uh, Duncan, I want to go over the pension issue with you. 
because I'm hearing different numbers than you've told us. First of all, am I correct in understanding that there's $15 million put away for 910 or, or for 1011 for the pension problem? Yeah, the yeah, yeah, short answer is that is correct. Um, and t the longer answer is, though, in 2001, 2, 3, when there was the high tech bust, we were also anticipating problems with our pension plan. So we started to uh, set aside some one time <laughs> money. Uh, and so, yes, we do have $15 million of one-time money set aside to help with the pension plan. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. And then the other thing is that um, the figure you've quoted that the pension plan is down, is that the latest figure? Because the one I've heard is about 12.5%. Um, actually, I think probably the number I have in here is probably a little higher than what it really is. It's the number Betsy gave me about two weeks ago but I expect the uh, drop in the uh, equity markets that happened in the last two weeks is probably, well, it's, it's probably it's a little less than the $650 million. Uh, the 12.5% number, that will be, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, so there's no doubt that it's 650 and it was like 760 a year ago at this time, but uh, it's probably more like 630 today if I had to guess, but it's a bit of a mugs game trying to monitor it. It's actually the real question is where is it going to be in 15 months, right? But, uh, yeah. Actually, one of the disadvantages of the current situation, but it's the disadvantages of, of human existence because we never know what's going to happen tomorrow, is we don't know what the province is going to give us. We don't know where the markets are going to be. Um, we don't know exactly how many students will come here. So there are three great question marks. And if we knew the answers to those things, we could say, well, this is exactly how much money we need, this is how we're going to find it, and this is what we're going to do. We're really clear, and we're doing it. Right now, we're living with a lot of uncertainties. We always live with those uncertainties, but the uncertainties seem to gang up in, in, in times like this. So when you're living with those uncertainties, the very best thing that you can do is plan conservatively, but also be really aggressive, optimistic, um, creative, and as I said, cohesive and strong, so that we have, we move further ahead. And if things were great, we'd be here. And if things are bad, we'll be here, but we'll still be ahead. And that's what we really are trying to do. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I'm the Vice President of Finance for the Graduate Students Association. Um, and as student elected representatives, uh, we continue to lobby uh, the fe both the federal and the provincial government, um, uh, considering that our goals are the same, to bring more money into our institutions and funding for our universities, thereby direct funding to students. Um, there seems to be a disconnect um, in our approach when we speak to the ministers, so when we speak to the MPs, the MPPs, and the senators, they state when we go to them that well, how come your administrations, how come your universities aren't asking for the same things? Um, so I just want to ask um, why you think this disconnect is there, considering that you state that we should work together, and I agree, we should work together. Um, but there still seems to be this disconnect when we do our part, when we lobby the government. Um, so why you think this disconnect is there? And how is it that they're receiving dif different responses um, or we're receiving different responses from, from the respective parties. Okay, well we did talk about this the other day in our meeting and I think there are two sides, or, you know, two parts to the answer. Um, part one is that each person expresses himself or does what he or she can do as related to his or her talents and his or her position. And so um, for the university president to go out and march with the students is perhaps not the most effective way of using the university president's position and time. If the university president can go and talk to the minister and obtain a private conference and have the opportunity to talk to the minister, then the university president should do that. Um, so. I don't, uh, you know, I know, I beg to differ, I know you want me, me to go out and, 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 and carry a flag and walk down the street. Um, 
that may be, in your opinion, the best way that I could be a president. Maybe I have a different idea of how I could best represent you. So that's one. Number two, I did tell you that um, at the Council of Ontario Universities, um, the majority of the university presidents said that if the province does not increase the funding to universities, that they saw no way of doing anything but asking for a tuition increase, and they would therefore ask for a tuition, for the ability to increase the tuition. Several university presidents, uh, and myself, I was one of them, said, I understand the need to, to do this, I understand the situation, but we also understand that students have needs and students don't want to pay additional fees. Is there not something else that we could do? Like what we did a few years ago, and um, I was, at that time I was president of Victoria University, and with the president of U of T, I, I proposed to the provincial government that we fu fund scholarships for students and that universities be allowed to create an endowment that the province would match to provide more funding for students. So I think it might be time for us to be really creative and think together of ways that we can persuade the government that they should invest in the future of our students. And that's, that's what I think we, we should do. I, I also think that it might be impossible to get to the point where um, people don't pay tuition. That's part of the, the, the benefits we all invest in our, ourselves as well as, as have everybody invest in us. Um, with all due respect, President Arante, uh, marching in the streets is just one aspect of what student representatives do. So we do, we do as, as you self has said, um, lobby the government and lobby the um, various MPs. So I was wondering if maybe we can have a joint meeting, uh, the president of this institution, all the student elected representatives go to the Minister of Training and Colleges um, to lobby for more funding for the universities. Um, that may be a possible solution that we can work together if we go in with the same goal. Well, why don't we, why don't we talk about what we can do and how we could do it? But um, you know, I think we have to think about what would be the winning argument and how we put forward that argument and how we make people understand that Carleton students are not only needy students, they're also the most responsible articulate and respectful students in Ontario. Uh, I'm John Nelson, the coordinator of the Science Student Success Centre. Uh, one of the things I noticed when I came to Carleton in February was just the number of things that Carleton has in place to keep the students that we actually have here. And I'm, as long as we can actually get the students to use them, it will, make an, it will definitely make an impact. What I've been looking at as well is just the number of, I was watching the, the charts that you actually had, uh, when we have domestic students, we have the tuition fees, plus we have the government grant that comes in. When we have international students, we have mainly just the tuition fees. In your opinion, and this might be a bad question, who do you think is the better investment right now in terms of the amount of money we're able to bring in? Is it better to go with in increasing the number of domestic students, or is it better to go with increasing the number of international students? In purely financial terms, it's about neutral, right? It, you know. Here we go. Solomon has spoken. <laughs> Hi, my name is Stuart Ryan. I work for the QP 4600, the teaching assistants and contract instructors, sort of the part-time staff uh, here at Carleton. Um, you say you're going to communicate with the union leadership. Does that include our union and, say, other unions, or is it just the faculty and support staff? It'll be all unions. And before I, conciliation, I hope. And we, we're, we're actually even going to have, if we can't afford the donuts, we're going to have the Timbits. Um, I just wanted to, I understand that budgets are living documents. Um, so if grad students are getting the $1 million from the $2 million that uh, you stated that the government has given us this year, I was just wondering why there's only a $40,000 um, increase on the budget for grad funding um, from last year. This is the budget that was posted online. So I'm assuming that the updated budget just hasn't been posted online. And when can we expect that? 
Well, I think it's probably just in a different line item than the one you're looking at. So it's, there's no doubt the money's been allocated in the budget. It's probably just in a different spot than where you're looking at a summary for. Do you know what line item that is? No. No. Can I email you and you sure, email I'd, me? I'd okay, be glad to you. tell you that, yeah. Um, hi. In the budget, there was a, about a 15% cut in equity services. Um, we talked about communication, so we communicated to our students. There was a referendum passed. Students voted highly in favor of a sexual assault center. We still don't have that, but there was the hiring of a sexual assault coordinator. Um, now, considering that there is this new full-time position in equity services, how do you justify this cut in equity services? Uh, you, you have a level of detail that I can't actually answer, so s s send me an email and I'll email you back, okay? I'm not... You sent me an email? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I'll answer it, yeah. Hey, how you doing? Uh, so I think one of the ways that we can save some money is uh, investing in retrofits for our buildings, uh, specifically Loeb and a couple others. Is there any um, plan to invest in creating, making our buildings more efficient uh, so that long-term projections, we can save money on things like energy uh, and those kinds of costs? Oh, well, the, the short answer is yes. I think the uh, facilities department and their strategic plan for a number of years has had an objective of reducing our uh, weather-adjusted energy consumption by at least 1% a year. Uh, Carlton went through a major energy retrofit in the mid-90s. Uh, the things that have happened uh, in the last year that I could tell you about, we replaced uh, some chillers in Dunton Tower and uh, the Stacy building. Probably these new chillers, with the things that are used to cool the buildings in the summer, probably use about 60% of the energy that the ones that were replaced. So yes, we continue to look at opportunities to do that and we'll do, continue to do that going forward. Yeah. Uh, my name is Bruno no, Murchison. No, but, uh, thank you, because we all do want to be sustainable. Yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Bruno Murchison. I'm the sustainability officer for the uh, university, uh, relatively newly hired. Um, and I, I just wanted to speak to that a little bit as well, that uh, um, there are various um, efficiencies that for sure we can gain, uh, without a doubt. One of the pieces that I will be working on for the fall will be an education and behavior change program uh, to try to start to address just what we can all do, uh, all the people in this building, and just shutting off lights and, and shared spaces even. Uh, for sure, there's equipment upgrades that we can do, but, uh, uh, and I will be putting together funding proposals to uh, show the payoff and, and some of those pieces uh, to try to encourage uh, uh, things like daylight sensors and, and uh, other retrofits that we can do. Um, there is some money, I know, in the current budget for 2009-2010 uh, for some pieces, uh, but for sure there's more, and uh, we'll be looking at the payoff because uh, it is a, a place that we can save money going forward. So, great. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's like I said, um, the motto of this university is, is work must carry on and continue. It's never completed, and I think it's exactly it. A woman's work is never done. Um, so neither is a man's, and we're, we're all going to have to do a lot of work together to continue making this university a great university, tough times notwithstanding. So thank you all for your time, for coming out and spending your extended coffee breaks with us. Um, we really appreciate your questions and thoughts. Keep emailing them, um, keep uh, writing, keep calling. We need your, your suggestions. Thank you very much. Can I just ask one quick, 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 quick question? It might be slightly outside of the budget. Could, just... could you come down and ask us here? Okay, we'll do it here. Thank you.